The GB News pub is well and truly open this evening, and Lord Jonathan Marland, Conservative peer, joins me. Welcome to Talking Finance. Good health. Mm. Now, we have a, cu- a couple of things in common. We decided to skip university and head straight for the city of London. It was a fun place to work in those days, wasn't it? Incredible, wasn't it? <laughs> Did you go to the Georgian Vulture? Do you remember that? Regularly, Simpsons, yes. Yes. All that. Yes. I mean, it was... We didn't do a lot of work, did we, really? Well, I, I think, I, actually, I kind of did. <laughs> we started our first business when we were 25, or I, I started in the first business when we were 25, and it was full on, because we were, and you remember this, a young lad coming to the city, you know, it was all quill pens and dead man shoes, and we were sort of like spivs on the block. Um, and so we, at uh, 25, starting in a new business and starting... Uh, in the Lloyd's insurance industry was like sort of, hang on. A strange on. thing to do. Well, it was, and we got a lot of criticism and people, we were sort of 25 years younger than the next comp- competition. And then, of course, Lloyd's went bust, basically, and um, it was an incredible period of stress as we sort of tried to help rebuild it. Yeah. So I, I, I had, I'd have to say it was very hard work. I think, I think I've had two... Incredible spells of hard work. That was that period. And then when I was a government minister, which is like, you know. Yeah. The difference, of course, is if you have success in the commercial world and insurance, as you do, uh, you can make money, you can lose money, but you have actually a private life as well at the weekends. <laughs> you can go and play golf or do whatever you want to do. Uh, what, what pushed you into politics? Um, it was an odd thing. People kept saying to me when I was in my late 20s, you, you'll go into politics. And I sort of thought, you must be daft. Um, and uh, I, I sort of thought this was absolutely ridiculous. And I'd, I'd pretty much given up working in the city when I was about 37, 38. And um, I met Michael Howard. And Michael Howard said, you ought to give it a go. And uh, I've always been a huge, oh, I am a huge fan of Michael's. Um, he was a man of great integrity and I mean, obviously he was criticised in many ways like any politician, but he, he's always been a... He's got rare things in a politician, complete loyalty and a great personal integrity. And uh, I like that in him. And um, uh, I got involved in his campaign to be leader, yeah. um, the unsuccessful one, when he did the deal with Haig and Haig decided not to uh, pursue that. And it's sort of, you know, you know what politics is like, but Once you're Nigel... In. It's, it's a drug. Yeah, it's like a lobster pot, isn't it? You see the bait, <laughs> in you go, you can't get out. I, mean, I know all about it. Exactly. You talk about backing Howard and Howard's qualities and personal integrity. Yeah. You also, of course, have known Boris Johnson very well for a long time. And the big question that's being asked now are questions about his, his personal integrity and mm. his relationship with the truth. Mm. Well, you know, the, the, the people have different qualities and uh, if you look at Boris's qualities which are totally different from Michael's if you want to compare them and, and in many ways similar to your own you know Boris gets up every morning and thinks everything is possible and you have those similar yep. tra- traits yourself and I, I do too he's got enormous enthusiasm huge energy great drive uh, he's got incredible charisma and, and uh, arguably like you can reach parts that the electorate of the electorate that haven't been reached before and it'll be a big mistake for the conservative party to uh, knife but, I, but I return to the point you know you, you, you talked about personal integrity yeah Michael Howard I, I wouldn't question that for a moment yeah um, but it's Boris's integrity that's on trial now isn't it correct and we've seen three more MPs today yeah have withdrawn their support I mean he's not going to survive this is he well I'm not sure about those MPs integrity I mean if they actually put the nation first they wouldn't want to be having a con- well just sorry Nigel but if they wouldn't want to be having a conservative leadership campaign that's going to take eight weeks yeah uh, of infighting as people posture for position uh, they wouldn't want that and shouldn't want it at this particular time of national importance and this is an incredibly important next few months I think for the country as you, I hope, would agree, the Brexit dividend has got to be well and truly sorted out uh, and hasn't been. Uh, the en- Why? Well, I think uh, they've been derailed, but I don't think they've realised that they have got to, to sort it. 
And I think once it registers... But they've got um, an 80-seat majority on the back Yeah, of it. but, you know, they've had COVID and crosswinds and, and, and all... I get the COVID yeah. thing, and I do understand. And, and you, like, you and I yeah, both want to push them. him, want to push them really hard yes. to get that Brexit dividend. And uh, I, I, I'm doing as such. Uh, so the, we've got to have the Brexit dividend. We've got a real challenge on energy crisis, as you have, have enunciated. And, you know, there hasn't been planning for the transition to net zero. There really hasn't been enough planning for the transition to net zero. But that's the other problem, isn't it, Jonathan? You know, Boris was elected as a Conservative. He's leading as a Liberal. <laughs> the commitment... Well, that's my... You know, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 Thank God we're in a pub. <laughs> well, that's a great thing about this. That's a great thing about this part of the show. We can have a chat, you know, the, and you can say what you like. <laughs> the, like and neither side takes offence, you know. But the commitment to net zero. Here we are, a country producing less than one. I don't know. And you were there as the minister for energy and climate change. Less than one percent of the world's CO two. We're prepared to beggar our industries, put people's bills through the roof. Mm. I mean, how have we got to the point where 25% of people's electricity bills already a green subsidy? There's something wrong here, isn't there? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with you. I mean, I, I think what is also wrong is this sort of business of littering the countryside with solar panels, taking away farmland which could be used, which we're going to be desperate for food security, mm. rewilding, all these sort of things which are not practical policies. You're pretty sceptical of much of this government, aren't you, really? No, I'm sceptical <laughs> about some of the government. I, 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 and and, and, and uh, the, those elements I am, and I've been quite clear, you know, Boris has got to lose the fluff from his policies and get back to okay. four policies which he believes in and which your old friend Linton Crosby uh, mm -hmm. w would advise him on, and, and, and Linton would call it getting the barnacles off the boat. <laughs> And I think that is uh, going to be the challenge. And, and if he can show that, he deserves a chance to deliver it. He deserves a chance to deliver the, um, uh, you know, the levelling up. Yeah. Well, we'll come to levelling up in a moment. And we've been debating it all evening. None I've of, heard you. I mean, none of us know what it means. <laughs> what does it mean? When we had the northern powerhouse with Osborne, and I never knew what that meant and nothing ever happened. Um, and now we have levelling up. But I want to get back to this point about energy and climate change. Mm. I mean, just give us in 30 seconds the Marland solution. What do we do about our energy requirements going ahead? Well, I've always been a strong believer in gas. Um, and being, uh, and when, we were, when I was in, in that department, we, we realised that gas was going to be the backstop. I was actually quite keen on fracking and, and, and uh, asked the department to set up the office of fracking so that we could really understand it because that is cheap homeland energy security. Lots of jobs. I, I, and lots of jobs. I'm also keen on uh, the transition to a greener economy because it's better for um, our emissions. Uh, you rightly say in, in the context of the world our emissions are minor, but mm. it is good housekeeping. It is something that uh, we should be looking at. I think you know, recycling, reusing of... Uh, of, uh, of, of plastics, and in fact, not having plastic at all would be a terribly good thing. I mean, amazing, everything you open these days got layers and layers of plastic. Yeah. We go through about four layers. Of no, I, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with you on any of this. I well, mean, I don't I disagree mean, with I you. Mean, I mean, those of us that are questioning net zero are not saying let's go back to burning coal on a huge scale. I mean, no. China and India are doing that anyway. But it's just this cost on people's bills, the cost that's already there, the proposed move to heat pumps. Um, electric cars are more expensive. It, to me, it's a sort of very upper middle class, wealthy group of people around Boris Johnson have, 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 have convinced him this is the right thing to do. But for ordinary folk, <clears throat> this is not affordable. Is well, I think there's a large part of the electorate, and particularly the younger generation, who see this as the future. So I don't think it's a coterie of upper middle class people around Boris persuading him. I think there is a general... Uh, mood uh, and understandable mood within the country that uh, we have got to uh, manage the earth better than we are doing. We have got to um, um, stop throwing pollutants into the world. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a perfectly reasonable and acceptable policy. The, the issue is, and this is where I think you and I do, the Venn diagram does uh, yeah. cross, is what is the transition? How do we get from there to there? Because it is not possible to go to net zero today. Um, without there being a massive cost no, I know. on the I know. taxpayer. I know, I know. Jonathan, I must ask you, as somebody that was Tory party treasurer, there are always arguments over party funding. Mm. Uh, now, of course, I have to say I far prefer 
private individuals giving money to politics than state funding of politics. You know, where you have state funding of politics, you have state regulation of parties, and, and, and that worries me. But the connection between donors and then becoming members of the House of Lords. It stinks. The country hates it. <laughs> no, the country hates it. Yes, yeah. Well, you're probably asking the wrong person uh, because I obviously was, have given money to the party. Um, I, I then sort of hoped to pay it back when I was a minister and worked for, yeah. for nothing. But the, 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 when I was, became treasurer, the first thing I did was impose a rule that you couldn't give more than 50000 a year to the party during a calendar year with the exception of election year. And I felt that was a reasonable figure, and I felt the public would live with that figure because it wasn't, mm. you know, 50,000 is a lot of money, I grant you, but it's not five million or yeah. a million and a half. And I thought that was uh, a good discipline. Um, in an election period, you have this huge, intense period where you've got to raise, you were going from six million a year, you've got to raise 20, and, 20 yeah, million yeah. a year. I mean, I mean that, and and, and uh, you, you've, you've obviously got That's OK, to, but should big donors go to the House of Lords? Well, I, I, I think the, the criteria for going to the House of Lords is as follows. One, have you made a big contribution to society? Have you done things outside of uh, your business career? Not, not just to a party, not just a big contribution <laughs> no, to a party. No, no, I'm talking business contributions. I know you. You are such a cynic, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing you, that's all. <laughs> I was teasing you. <laughs> um, but you, you, you've, got to have, you've okay. got to have built a, a substantial business or done some... Uh, you know, something very Big creative. Team. Yeah, You've got to have made a contribution to things outside of your business and wealth mm. for the benefit of society. Mm. And, you know, if by chance you've given half a million quid to a party, whatever it is. Well, you know, those, those are... That, I that's, tell you what, the next, time, understandable. the next time there's a big House of Lords funding route, I'm going to get you back on the programme. Jonathan Martin, privilege. thank you for joining me on Talking Pints.